Hi, I'm uh, Kyle Smith with the USFL Project, and man, I'm, I'm glad to be here. This is a this is this is a fun time. Thanks for having me. No problem at all. No problem at all. Now there are so many questions that I just mentioned three seconds ago that I want to ask, but I guess the first one is, why the USFL? So the USFL came around for me when I was about nine or ten, and it was it was dynamic it was it was new football it was in the spring you know there there had been leagues before i was able to pay attention to football and i wasn't a part of those but it came at a very impressionable time for me and the the teams were new uh the the uniforms were new there was a lot of fun going on with the usfl it was it was just so exciting and you know at that time the nfl had kind of had that moniker of the no fun league right and and here's this new league that's going to come in in 83 and have all these new teams it was it was just very very exciting so i i got into it at a young age and then um and then the uh, 84 expansion uh was brought in and there was going to be a team in oklahoma and yeah, you know, I didn't know all of the intricacies behind what had actually happened with that team. Uh, we were just excited to have a team. Now, unfortunately for me, they put the team in Tulsa, and uh, I lived about 45 minutes uh, south of Oklahoma City. So at that time, before I moved to Texas, uh, Tulsa was quite a haul for a 10-year-old kid. Right. And people that are from other states think, oh, Tulsa, Oklahoma City, got to be like, what, eight minutes away from each other. Right. Not, not the way it works. Well, I'll give you a little background where I jump in from. Okay, so I'm a little bit older. So I was born like the last two years of the AFL. Okay. okay, so back in the 60s. And then I go through, okay, we get through that, we start the Super Bowls, and even though I'm from Ohio, and Paul Warfield was with the Browns when we first moved there. He goes to the Dolphins, right? So mm-hmm. I'm a I'm a closet Dolphins fan, even though I'm a Browns fan. And then I go with the WFL when uh, Warfield, Kick, and Zonka leave the Dolphins and join the new league. And that didn't last that long. So then I'm thinking, okay, where do we go from here? Because as you said, we have the, the No Fun League, and then this upstart league comes in, and they start getting, not only do they get players that have played in the NFL, they're getting players that you've seen on TV in college. And if you're a college football fan, you know, the Lindsey Nelsons and the Keith Jacksons and those guys announcing games, you're starting to see guys filter in from the college ranks going straight to the USFL. So let, let's go with how do we get the league formed, and then we'll jump into that because I think that's pretty important too. So now I, I got to jump in here with a question. Okay. You sure. said you were a closet Dolphins fan. Are you still a Dolphins fan? I am a fan of all things football now. So it's kind of hard to be a – I still call myself a Cleveland Browns fan. And anyone that, that knows me that's listening to this will say, yeah, he's still a Cleveland Browns fan. But everything else is like I love good football. So it's kind of hard to pigeonhole me that way anymore. So let me ask you, gun to your head – Who's going to be the Dolphins quarterback at the start of this next season? Wow. Um, gun to my head, I think it's going to be Tua. Because I I just think that they're going to say, we can't do what everyone else is – we can't draft a guy, say he's going to be the guy, and give him half a season to figure it out. And you're going to have to figure it out this, way, this year one way or another. Kind of yeah. like – you, it's funny you've got a lot of quarterbacks who are very disgruntled right now and so yeah. uh, there, there's a lot of good betting odds if you want to jump in on uh, on who you think is going to land where it could it could be a uh, not only fun but profitable well the way it's been working recently now i understand if you're if you draft a defensive end high and he doesn't quite pan out you can slide him out the side door you know the, the browns barcavis mingo is the example i think of right away amongst others in the past, but it's like, well, he didn't, he tweaked this. You can't, it's hard to do that with quarterbacks. You look at a, a Josh Rosen, who, when I saw him play in college, I wasn't overly impressed to begin with, but that's another story entirely. 
But it's like, you just drafted this guy in the top ten, and then you go, no, oh, next year we'll get another quarterback too. You know, uh, the Sam Darnold situation with the Jets. Is he on solid footing? You know, and these are guys who were just drafted. And ESPN, I don't quote ESPN often, but ESPN posted a graphic, and they continue to post it during the whole Jared Goff and and uh, and Matt Stafford thing and, and all that of the quarterbacks drafted since, I think, 2016. It might have been before that. Maybe it was 2009, something like that. But of the quarterbacks drafted in the first round, none of them are with the same team anymore up until, you know, a couple of years ago. You're like, and wow. That is an outstanding fact. I mean, yeah. I mean that, that's something that you thought in 2016, you would have never thought that that would become a reality. Right. But I, that's, the, that's the reality of the situation, yeah. right? Yeah, with uh, Carson Wentz moving, that was the last domino to fall. So I think it was like 2009 to 2016 or something like that. And it's like, are you kidding me? Yeah, that, and that's the, the reality of it. You have a few years to get it done. And if you don't get it done, you're out. But the flip side of that is you do draft somebody that high and put all that expectation on him and the fact that there were question marks to begin with. I think with two, you have to say, okay, we have to really make sure this sticks because we've got other stuff around him that, that will work. If he can do what he's supposed to do, we're good. Give him a season, maybe half a season, I don't know, and let him go. I think that's what the Washington football team did with Dwayne Haskins, you know. When the season started, we were debating on a few other shows, what's going to happen? Well, he's got to start. Well, why? Because they have to see what they have. You, you know, you can't just let the guy ride the bench and not figure it out if you're going to pay him that kind of money, and you want him to be the franchise guy. And we found out in their mind that he wasn't a franchise guy. Okay, move on. So I think that's what happens with Tua. I think you're right. Yeah. So um, let's – I know we kind of got the listeners <laughs> Oh, that. There. That's the, if they if they watch my show they they're used to that. I never stay on point, and I think they like it for that. So, <laughs> so, um, so the USFL was actually a little bit older idea than um, than the formation. So David Dixon had this idea, and and David Dixon, by the way, very a very intelligent businessman, and um, he was very instrumental in the New Orleans Superdome. And he formed the Dixon plan because he wanted to uh, be a part of the NFL. So he formed this back in 1965. Right. And uh, so, so the plan was, was much older than the actual formation. And then uh, when they decided to go forward in uh, 81, 82, uh, that's, where, that's where the USFL was formed. That's where they put the cities together. They realized uh, that there was a need for more football, which, you know, that's what a lot of us still feel. I mean, right. I, I know that there's been a lot of uh, leagues that have tried to form. Um, people have gotten behind them. Yeah, you know, I, I think it's a little tough in the bigger cities because if you're in L.A., I mean, you have to put out a winning product or nobody's going to come watch. I mean, right. it the the Lakers are a prime example. I mean, before before the Lakers started having success, nobody was going to see the Lakers, right. and and up until recent years, nobody was going to see the Clippers. I mean, you it, it's like the old joke where you know you had two tickets to a Clippers game on your dashboard, and somebody broke into your car and left two more. Right. I mean, yeah. It was it was that bad. Right. Yeah. So, so the, the Angels the same way. Right. Yeah, it's the same way. I mean, it's it, you know, it's a tough market, but you know, the the owners decided to um, you know take control and and go forward and form the USFL in 1982, and they kicked off in 1983. No preseason games, um, and yeah, the other thing that I think is interesting. There's a lot of talk in the NFL, and and it depends on which side you sit on, but the NFL is um, expanding to 17 games. It's, it's going to happen. It's been a contentious point between the players, um, between the players' association, between the owners, but they're going to they're gonna expand the 17 games. And I look back at this and I go, congratulations. The USFL played an 18-game schedule, and they had no bye weeks. Right. So the first year, they played 18 weeks, and then if you were lucky enough to get into the playoffs, then you had another two or three games – 
to go. So you're playing 21 straight games that Michigan and uh, Philadelphia played in the first year. They played 21 weeks in a in row. row with no bye weeks. Right. And you heard no complaints out of those guys because those guys just wanted to play football. That's what the USFL was all about, and that's what made it so great. Those guys just wanted the opportunity to play football. So the the bye weeks, you know, didn't matter to them. They were getting paid to do what they love, and that's right. one of the grassroots things that made the USFL so great. Well, it, it's I think it's the thing when you look at it, when there's competition. Now, if you've made an NFL roster, you have a taxi squad or practice squad or whatever they call it now, and those guys are your competition, but they're really not your competition. They're there in case somebody gets hurt, basically. And then you have nothing else to worry about. So now you're in a stable position where you can say, we want to do this, we want to do that. We want to be. We don't want to play a 17 game season. We don't want to play regular uh, preseason games. We don't want to do this. We don't want to travel. We don't want to play in the Pro Bowl because you have no alternative. Your hunger has been satisfied by getting to the league. Now, obviously, you want to perform and win and all that stuff. I get that, but your your hunger to be a performer has been satisfied. But you look back to the USFL and you go, wait a second. There's somebody nipping at our heels here. You know, and and I think it, in my estimation of it when it first started was this is a joke. This is just this what they're playing in the spring. Who the heck's going to play? Because I went through eight years ago watching the WFL fold. Like, well, they don't have any stars. Who do they get to come over from the NFL? I can't remember anyone that really. And you'll correct me if I'm wrong. Who a star from the NFL that said, you know what, I'm going to play in the spring. I can't think of anyone who do that. And again, correct me if I'm wrong, but off the top of my head, I can't think of any any name players that said that. They're getting guys from college that we haven't heard of, and then you know retreads and guys that you know Doug Flutie. Well, he didn't make an NFL, you know, uh, guys like that. And you go, wait a second, these guys can play. You know, it, it's it's kind of funny you say that because not only not only was it competition between leagues where you know the NFL and USFL, even though they didn't go head to head, they were they were com- semi competing with fan bases. Right. Uh, but you know the one of the lost things about that is some of the NFL players actually used the USFL players for leverage. Right. Right. And um, and a prime example. And a guy who has a has some really really good barbecue restaurants, by the way, uh, was Billy Sims. Yeah, Billy Sims was unhappy in Detroit. Right, he he was unhappy. He wanted to leave, and so he started negotiating with doc, Dr. Jerry Argovitz with the Houston Gamblers, who had just gotten an expansion team in 1984. And Billy Sims got to the point where he signed a USFL contract. Oh, Billy Sims' USFL contract with the Houston Gamblers is out there, and it became a very contentious point. It went legal. You know, we all know the outcome. Billy Sims ended up back in Detroit. But he's just one of many examples that said, listen, if, if I can't get what I want in the NFL, there is a viable option right. for me to play somewhere else and make a career. And, and we mentioned Billy Sims. We can talk about Kelvin Bryant. We can talk about, uh, like I said, Doug Flutie, Jim Kelly, uh, Reggie White, guys that uh, – Herschel Walker, obviously. Guys that decided, this is another option for me. This is a way I can go. And, and then guys like maybe a Gary Zimmerman, who may not have had an NFL career, you never know, if he hadn't been for the USFL. And now he's in the Hall of Fame. So there are lots of people that you say they jump-started their career. Or, or um, I think a better example of that is uh, Bobby Joe Hebert. Oh, sure. Yeah, it's like, um, well, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, and, and, you know, I think, I, for me, the best example, and I'm, I'm going to try not to get too passionate here, but I get very <laughs> passionate when I talk That's about this right. gentleman. And, um, so the prime example for me is Sam Mills. Yeah, Sam exactly. Mills would Sam Mills was undersized. Mm-hmm. The, the NFL would have didn't want him, would have never taken him. So he took the opportunity and went to the USFL, turned in not only a USFL Hall of Fame career, but doubled down and made it 
an NFL Hall of Fame career, even though the Pro Football Hall of Fame does not recognize him as right. a Hall of Fame. Yeah. Sam Mills should have been a Hall of Famer 10 years ago. Right. And, I, and I will plant my flag in the ground on that. Yeah. He was the, he was the epitome of football. He was the epitome of an underdog story. He did not take the shortcut. He took the long way through the USFL, three championship games, two USFL championships, parlayed it into a career with the New Orleans Saints and Carolina Panthers, and then stayed in football and and helped grow the sport. Yeah. Sam yeah. Mills, Sam Mills and his family should have had a gold jacket. Yeah. a long time ago and i will say this if it's truly the pro football hall of fame he should be in right he should already be yeah. in right and there are a few more you can add to that as well i'm sure but yeah exactly and and i use my example from cleveland is the ice cube Jer gerald mcneil we never would have seen gerald mcneil in cleveland if it hadn't been for the sfl we may not have ever seen him in a park before after that i mean he got a shot you know, five seven, 145 pounds or whatever he was, you know, he like or 165, whatever they listed him as, he was lighter than that. You know, like, and he, it, not only was it electrifying, it was game-changing the way he played. I had never seen on that team, and rarely in pro football, someone who could change the dynamic of a game in 10 seconds. And, Phenomenal. And, and case in point with, uh, with Ice Cube, uh, he actually has a uh, USFL record that will stand forever. Um, he has the longest punt return in mm -hmm. USFL history. I believe it was 87 yards, but uh, I, I won't I won't completely swear to that. But yeah, you're right. He he and so many others could change the game at the drop of a hat. Now, how did we get some of these players? That what was the scouting? What was the the, the player acquisition, because there are names that, I, okay, for example, how does Reggie White end up in the USFL and not in the NFL? You know, I think for, I think for Reggie, I think it was opportunity. Um, he, he had the opportunity to go to the NFL, but I think he knew that he wouldn't play right away. Mm -hmm. And with the USFL, it gave him an opportunity to go to Memphis and uh and and start and play right away and and let me tell you something uh you know the couple of couple of things about memphis um one reggie white had an amazing career i mean it turned it into a hall of fame career but the 1985 memphis showboats on paper had one of the best defenses you will ever see and i actually talked to steve Earhart about this a few months ago and uh, I was kind of, it was kind of surprising to me, you know, the conversation that we got in depth with. But the funny thing is with the 85 Memphis Showboats, Reggie White wasn't the best defensive lineman on that team. John Corker was. Yeah. And it, John, John Corker was a man among boys. I mean, he had, he had amazing sack totals. He, he was in the backfield disrupting the entire time. So you've got a Hall of Famer on one end, and you've got John Corker on the other side, who, you know, a case could be made for him with his right. with all of his stats because not only did he play in the USFL and the NFL, he played in the AFL too and won championships. Right. Yeah. It, it's and it's amazing how once we start seeing, and I, I'm glad your project does this. Once we start seeing, you know, we hear stories, but we don't know facts. We hear stories but we haven't spoken to the people so we don't know you know the the idea of okay how did we get the 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 k gun in buffalo you know well we we bring in you've got mouse davis and jim kelly with the houston gamblers and we also have marv levy in the league as well after being if i'm if i'm looking at my chronology right after being the coach of the chiefs he ends up being in the osfl as well so you've got all that stuff merging and boiling and stewing together and you go, yeah, let's try that in Buffalo. Huh? How? What? what? Really? Okay. So you have those kind of things, and you also have power running games. You have stout defenses. It's, it's amazing. The, the, I believe, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, a lot of what was done strategy-wise changed the NFL from being the no-fun league to being a little more wide open. 
Uh, and I completely agree with that. Because, and you can even see uh, later on that the NFL took so much from the USFL, from you know, from the challenge flag to um, you know, replay officials. They they took a lot from the USFL. And you know, going back to your original point, um, you know, you've got Jim Mora who coached in the right. Philadelphia Those and stars, Baltimore right. Stars. I mean, right. you had some real – you had Walt Michaels in, in New Jersey. You had right. some really, really big-name coaches. In, in 84, 85, um, the, the Washington Federals were going to move. They were originally going to move to Miami and be the spirit of Miami. And uh, that, that deal tanked, but the whole time that they were getting ready to move – they were negotiating with Howard, Howard Schnellenberger, right. who was one right. of the big name college coaches at the time. Right. And, you know, like I said, the move, the move ended up not working out and they moved to Orlando and became the renegades. But they had deep, deep negotiations with Schnellenberger to become the head coach. It's, it's amazing. And you start thinking of things like, you know, the, the one back offense at the Redskins, Washington football team, however you want to call them now. I believe they got that when they brought in Kelvin Bryant and they started doing it. And I, I could be wrong about the timing of that, but I think that's about the right time where they said, you know, when Riggins and they started borrowing from what they were seeing in the USFL, we don't need a fullback. We can roll with the tailback and we can go with two tight ends and, and things, you know, things that weren't done in the, in the NFL before that. Now, Todd Fowler with the Houston Gamblers might disagree with you a little bit about not needing the fullback because Todd <laughs> really need- good uh but but yeah you're you're right the one back system was uh definitely a bigger success you didn't need the fullback and going back to the uh washington football team i would i would love nothing more than to see the usfl fans rock the vote because they've got their website now where they're taking submissions i would love to see the usfl fans rock the vote and and just go federals all the way right just to again make the NFL realize that there are still some of us out there that are so passionate about the USFL. If if federal started rising to the top of the list, right. you have to recognize that that you can't discount it. Well, and also looking at and you made a very valid point. You're looking at, at cities who are not considered to be NFL cities, maybe now, or in, there's an expansion or a movement or whatever, but they drew very well. In the USFL, so uh, the, ahead, the, the Jaguars are the um, the, the example. The Jacksonville Jaguars do not exist without the success of the Jacksonville Bulls. The Jacksonville Bulls were consistently at the top of the attendance rankings, and that's that's the only reason that the NFL even took a look. Right. Uh, one, of the, one of the other things is um, the USFL had expansion, uh, not expansion, exhibition games in uh, in Carolina, and they were right. wildly right. successful. Right. That's why Carolina got a look. Right. You don't. You you most likely don't have the Panthers without the USFL dipping their toe out in the Carolinas. And if I remember, that expansion was in '96, if I'm not mistaken. I think was it was not. Five. 95, the Panthers and the Jaguars. Yeah, so it's not too far after that. So those feelings yeah. are still there in both of those areas, yeah. And just, uh, they're, like I said, when we, off air, I've got about 27 questions. I said five, but you about 27 that I, that I have in mind. But we're, we're going into, we're flowing into different things that I, that I thought of, but I didn't really think I'd get to. Um, and it's great. When, let's go to the concept of, spring football as opposed to doing head-to-head to begin with. How did that come about? Is that a Dixon thing or is that a, this is just makes more sense because you don't want to try and topple the Giant? That was part of the Dixon plan the whole time. The, this, the spring football, uh, it, was, it was a need for more football. The, and, and going head-to-head with the NFL and, and, and being in Texas, you're even going head-to-head with high school football. Right. Right. High school football's king. You've got You've got high school, college, and pro all in the fall. Friday, so, Saturday, Sunday, right. What are you going to do? Right. Yeah, so the, so the Dixon plan was, was to bring it to the spring so that basically you had football year-round. I mean, the USFL played into, into July, and they even did um, 
they they even had a concept in uh, 84 they played an exhibition game after the championship game which was very unique tampa and uh, the tampa bay bandits and the uh, philadelphia stars went over to london where have you heard that before? I remember that, yeah. yeah. And, played, and played an expansion game over there, or ex- exhibition game over there in 84. And now Commissioner Goodell can't wait to put an NFL team right. in London. He's, he's chomping at the bit to put a team in London. Where did he get that idea? Yeah. Well, it, he, and got, it's, yeah. he got the idea from the exhibition game. And it's funny, this is, memories are, are coming back, because I remember that. Football? We can't have football in Wembley. What is this stuff? You know, it, 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 pardon my lousy English accent. It's usually much better than that. But the, the idea of you're going to play American football in Wembley Stadium? You've got to be joking. You know, especially when you've got 17 other stadiums in London you can play in. Why would you, you know, desecrate the stadium, the arena, in in all of soccer, and play a game, it, and it it went very well. It went very well, and and again, you mentioned Tampa Bay. Now you've and maybe there's no correlation to this, but I know there's a large Tampa Bay Buccaneers following in England. Absolutely, and you know, and the Bandits were not only wildly successful uh, in Florida and across the United States, but. They, they carried that success uh, to London and across the pond. And, and of course, one of the reasons was you had, you had a world famous, wildly renowned, renowned actor in Burt Reynolds that was the owner. And he, he was uh, owner with Lonnie Anderson, who was his wife at the time. And so there, there was a lot of Hollywood appeal coming out of Tampa. So their, their success uh, was, was twofold. They put a great product on the field, and they had a, a star, a star ownership. And it was insane because you'd say, "Burt Reynolds just put his name to this." And well, let's get to that because that's I think that's a very important thing. In the NFL, you have mega businessmen who have made their money doing something else, who have put their money into this. In the USFL, you had celebrities with some bucks behind it. Who are some of the backers of some of the teams? Oh, you know, you Burt Reynolds? Uh, Lee Majors was uh, a part owner for the LA Express. Uh, mm-hmm. Not a lot of people knew that. Dion Warwick was um, a little bit of a factor in the LA Express as well. Uh, you know, depending on, and, and I don't want to uh, get into this too much, but you had Donald Trump in New Jersey who, right. uh, who had some at that time celebrity appeal, right. uh, or before his political run. So yeah, there were a lot of there were a lot of big names that were involved with the USFL because again, they they didn't have the opportunity to be a part of the NFL because for whatever reasons, whether it's financial or otherwise, and so they took the opportunity to be a part of the USFL and especially Bert. I mean, he he took the. He took that opportunity because uh, you know he he lived in that area even though he was mostly in Hollywood he he lived in that area and he wanted a successful franchise um, in that town because the the Buccaneers really hadn't had a lot of success in the you know early seventies and eighties when they started out I mean they were they were horrible um, and it, he, wanted, he wanted to put winning football in Tampa and, and also looking at it as well. Because, as we mentioned, we had the NFL as being the straight and narrow, no fun league, the, the Tom Landry and the Fedora, and this is what we're going to do. And we go to, let's have some fun with this. And if you watch, especially if you watch the Houston Gamblers game, for example, it's like these guys are just, they're just all over the place. Jim Kelly's having a blast. Now, you don't think that that's going to translate to the NFL. Well, he can't possibly play quarterback like that in the NFL. Oh, maybe he can. Huh, how about that? You know, uh, one of one of my friends, uh, Joe Sampson, runs a um, a Facebook page, but more importantly, a YouTube page called USFL Forever. And there was a game in 1985 that was deemed by Sports Illustrated as the greatest game no one saw. And 
Joe chased and chased and chased after film footage, finally finding film footage. And then he spent hundreds, if not thousands of hours putting that game together. I talked to him at length um, at one point about this. And he said, if you watch it, you're going to see a lot of the same cheerleader shots, a lot of the same <laughs> right. crowd shots, because, because I only had limited um, film footage to work with. But I would, I would highly recommend anybody who was a fan of the USFL or needs to dip their toe into the USFL to kind of see what it was all about. There's, there's plenty of footage on his, uh, on his channel of other games, and there are some great games out there. But the greatest game no one ever saw, that's, that's the one. That, that's the pinnacle. That's where you start to go dip your toe into the USFL. And it was it's amazing because it, the, the thing that I think most teams, most leagues, that they the, the pattern they're following now is that we need to have TV coverage. So what was the, or, or media coverage in general, what was the, of the greatest game no one saw, what was the basic media package that the USFL was able to, to come up with to start the league, or did they have one? The, the basic media package was with, uh, with ESPN. Um, and ESPN was a, a you know a, a startup pretty right. much at the time. So I can I can remember as a kid, and this is I'm sorry, this is where I'm going to become a bigger nerd than I already am. <laughs> but but I can remember being excited about ESPN, and when I would get home from school, I would turn on ESPN, and I was going to catch one of three things. I was going to catch um, Australian Rules Football. Mm -hmm. I was going to catch AWA Championship Wrestling, yep. or I was going to catch Roller Derby. Ah. That's a, a, at about 3.30 Central Time. That's what I, I that one of three things. That's what I was going to turn yeah, on right. on ESPN. And I would sit down and I would watch that stuff. It was, it was on. It, it was the greatest stuff around. And, and ESPN bought into the USFL. Which, by the way, um, for the for the main games, had two Hall of Fame announcers in Keith Jackson and Lynn Swan. Right, right. So ESPN was very uh, instrumental in the USFL and and was with them until the end. But with the with the greatest game no one saw, that that game wasn't picked up as one of the important games in February of 1985. So there was there was hardly even any local coverage right right they were they were focused on other things i mean you just had philadelphia winning the first championship miles tannenbaum and jim mora chuck fusina kelvin bryant you know all those guys raising the trophy and really setting the bar after they had been in the 83 championship the year before and and by the way, that's another game. <clears throat> Excuse me. That's another game that everybody should watch is the '83 championship game between Michigan and Philadelphia. Uh, it was. Uh, it came down to the wire. Very good. Um, there are a lot of people that when when we talk about that game uh, on the USFL project and the USFL project Facebook group, there are a lot of people that have a lot of opinions about that game and and how it went and how it ultimately went down. So. Uh, Another another must watch on the USFL Forever channel. It's it's funny you mentioned ESPN and, and those early days and and how many different things that you got into because they weren't covered on a regular basis and USFL is one. Whenever I pick up something heavy, I go back to the world's strongest man. And go, I am Magnus Ver Magnuson. Yeah, but it's the it's the idea of it's there, but you've got to go find it. And people went and found it. That's the thing that I think is impressive. I don't know of anyone of a certain age that can say, USFL, what was that? We all knew it. We all knew it. And and it was something that it was hard to find. Yet, or, you know, it, I, I remember seeing, a, you know, some Sports Illustrated covers and some Inside Sport and Sport Magazine covers. But you had to go look for it. It wasn't like they put it in your face. But then they became successful. Then they started getting players like, Anthony Carter, and again, we mentioned Kelvin Bryant, and players, you know, Jim Kelly, who was a high first-round draft pick by the Bulls, by the Bills, I'm sorry, out of Miami, and yet chose that route. Now you start seeing guys coming into the league that are 
NFL quality, I shouldn't put it that way, NFL favored players that the NFL wanted to get, and now we have bidding wars and, and that kind of stuff. So it had to fall apart some kind of way. What brought about the demise? There, it's a it's kind of a complicated answer, but the the short answer to that is that the uh, once the league got going, the owners were not following the Dixon plan. The Dixon plan is very detailed. It's very laid out, and there were owners that just decided that they were not going to follow the plan. They started frivol- frivolously spending. And that really, that along with um, the huge expansion in 1984, uh, that that led to the demise of the USFL. Everybody wants to point, and I know I know where a majority of people point. I know the finger that they point to one single person and one single decision, but it wasn't that. It, it really wasn't. It was it was all the owners. They. They got a great taste of success early on in 83. The TV ratings were good and climbing. And, you know, I mean, it's greed. It was, it, it, it was quite simply, it was, it was greed among some owners. Well, let's go back to the Dixon plan. Was the Dixon plan to not get into a bidding war with the NFL? Was the Dixon plan to not start getting players that were, you know, first round NFL players and bring them to the USFL? Or was it more to be a, for lack of a better way, of putting an ancillary league that just played in the spring and wasn't on caliber with the NFL? Um, the, the, anyway. Dixon, the Dixon plan was more about the, about the financials of each team and, and staying, staying in your lane, staying within your boundaries financially. And that, like I said, the the owners just got greedy. I mean, you know, you can you can point wherever you want, but you know, Michigan went out and basically stole the Pittsburgh Steelers' offensive line. Right. I mean, they they signed they signed anybody that had um, that had worn black and gold on that offensive line and built this offensive line and went way over way over the spending margins that were laid out in the Dixon plan. And and there's countless teams. I'm. I am absolutely not picking on the Michigan Panthers. They were sure, sure. They, they were a fantastic franchise. Um, you know, it, it kind of irks me um, every time I hear. There's a way to say it, but I hear people say the Detroit Lions haven't won a pro football championship since the 1950s, and I'm like, that is an ignorant statement. You know, the the city of Detroit has had a championship. The right. Detroit Lions may not have won a championship since 1950. The city of Detroit has, right. But when people say the city of Detroit haven't had a pro football championship since 1950, that's not accurate. It's just not accurate. And and they've had several since then because the you know not only did the Michigan Panthers win in 83, but the Detroit Drive won in the Arena Football League right. as well. Right. So th- th- those are – to me, that's that's part of the education. That's one of the reasons why the USFL project started as as just a small hobby, and as we started seeing that there were more and more fans. I mean, I I never thought that there would be a hundred people that would follow the USFL project on Facebook, and now our Facebook group is is four thousand. Right. Yeah. I, I was just, I was shocked, and. That's one of the that was one of the turning points for me for the USFL project is we not only need to preserve the legacy of the players, the coaches, the cheerleaders, the the trainers. I mean, we we embrace everything that has to do with the USFL, but we also have to bring in a youth movement right. because all of these people have children and grandchildren. They need somewhere to go, to um, to to look at that legacy. Because yeah, you hear your granddad who's sitting in a rocking chair going, "Yeah, I played professional football," and you you've got kids. I've got a fourteen year old daughter. I mean, I I've seen the eye roll. I don't know right. how many times, but we've got to have a place to immortalize these guys because you know the the one thing I that I've told um, 
my team, which by the way, the USFL project has a fantastic team. Um, yeah, Tom Cadle, uh, Rob Butts, Jim Parcells, A.M. Nunley. I mean, we do, we, we do a lot behind the scenes. We are doing a ton behind the scenes. So we have a fantastic team that works on the USFL project. Um, but we, we're, we're wanting to work on that youth movement because again, you've got, you've got kids, you've got grandkids, you know, we're, we're very lucky. We, we actually have, um, uh, John Bassett, who was the, who's the son of the late owner of the, or late general manager of the, um, Tampa Bay bandits, John Bassett. And, um, we also have Michael Corey, who's the son of, uh, coach Dick Corey, who was the coach of, uh, the Boston breakers who moved to new Orleans and still were the breakers and then moved to Portland and still, and were, still the were the breakers. Right. Yeah. The probably the only franchise that has moved to three different cities and kept their original. Name. Name. Well, the, the idea of the, the concept of don't overspend, don't, don't blow your budget because that's, you know, obviously you can't play if you can't afford to pay. I, I get that. And the idea of we're not going head to head because that's not we are, what we are. We're trying to give more football, not move our way into someone else's lane. Is that is that a concept that is that what the XFL and the uh, Alliance of whatever I can't remember how it was put together is that what these people were trying to do, or is that a model worth that, that's going to be sustainable now in this generation? I think it's a model that it would be sustainable for a spring league. And you know, I, I, I know Dwayne Johnson watches your show and I would, I would highly recommend to him to at least be familiar with the Dixon plan going forward with the XFL, because it, it will work. It will work if people follow it. And I, I believe that. Well, I think it's something that, I mean, again, being in the heart of it, okay, let, let me step out of announcer mode and, and, and ask the question that I'm dying to know. When we decided we're going head to head, was that the death knell or was that just there were other factors involved with that? Could it have happened? Could it have worked? Because I believe it could have. I look at the AFL model and say, we've got a comparable product on both sides here. Maybe there's a merger. Maybe we can go head to head. Maybe we can be better than NFL. I don't know. When I watch the USFL game, I'm like, this is quality football. It's not backyard. Just nobody's out there playing. They had quality players. Now, so I guess the question is, the idea to take it out of spring football, going against the Dixon plan, was that the where we said it's over, or were there other factors involved? Because I thought it was going to work, to tell you the truth. I I agree with you, um, and it's like uh, it, Tom always tells me this: you catch more flies with honey. I think that had the USFL uh, approached the NFL in a more friendly format, I I do believe that two fall leagues could work simultaneously. But at, back then, I don't believe that now. No, no, no. I, absolutely. The, the NFL is a juggernaut. Some would say even a monopoly. There's, there's no chance of that happening now. But I do believe back then it probably could have worked um, if, if, they had, if they had worked together and you know, had separate networks um, maybe even a championship game between the two leagues at the end, the way the uh, the AFL and NFL did back in right. the '60s. Um, I, I do think it could have worked, but the the approach with the NFL was more aggressive than it should have been, especially with the franchises that you had in in '84 and '85, because there were there were already fi financial struggles there. Right now. With that, there were successful franchises too. I think, you know, I think with the with the right approach, I think instead of talking about the Jacksonville Jaguars, you'd probably be talking about the Jacksonville Bulls right. in in the NFL. Um, uh, you know, I think I, I think depending on the landscape, 
Um, I think the Raiders had moved to L.A. at that time. At that point, right. So I think you could could have been talking about the Oakland Invaders mm-hmm. in Oakland, and the Raiders would have stayed put in L.A. Uh, I think with the right approach, yes, uh, they could have worked hand in hand, but the the approach was wrong. I think if and, and correct me if I'm wrong here, I think that if we would have if if you would have they would have I'm trying to personalize and I guess I shouldn't do that if it had been another four or five years later because there are I think two factors in there one you've been able to stabilize your franchises you would have known who was working who wasn't and you established that base in, in the cities that you were in because I think at that point you would have stopped the moving from Boston New Orleans to Portland and this and that and all that you would have been able to everyone would have been stable and the second thing which you probably couldn't have guessed at that point but if you would have, if they would have hitched their rat, their wagon to the ESPN juggernaut that was about to explode, you know, you would have had a huge network about to be a huge network to yourself, and that would have been, I think, very important. The ESPN, USFL on ESPN, as opposed to ESPN trying to get into this, get into that, whatever. ESPN might have went this way instead of that way, and that would have been a nice thing to have. Because at that point, again, cable coverage, you had ESPN, CNN, and a bunch of other shows, stations that you didn't know what the world there were. So, but by 88, 89, now you've got a whole new way of looking at the world, and ESPN's at the forefront of that. And if their model program or model programming would be the USFL, there might be a whole different way of looking at things. And, and I agree. And, you know, when ESPN was with, um, with the USFL till the end, but you know, at that point, it, it, you had just gone, you had gone too far down the rabbit hole with the lawsuit, and right. uh, you know, with moving teams around because of financial struggles. I mean, we we mentioned the breakers already, but the Federals had left Washington, right. and Washington, Washington was a successful NFL city at the time, but the Federals, you know, were not drawing how they should, so they went to went to Orlando. I think you were just too far. You were too far into the competition, and then um, you know financial struggles with some teams, moving uh, moving franchises, and then the you know the brash attempt to try to move to the fall. Uh, I I think the I think the partnership with them could have worked, and it would have brought ESPN to a whole other level as well as the USFL. It was it, it was just you know it, it almost always comes back to greed. And yeah. wanting, wanting that financial success and needing more and needing more, and it just you know unfortunately the demise um, of the USFL happened. Well, I look at it as, and I always use this example, and I always it sounds coming out of my mouth like I'm always slamming Gary Bettman of the NHL, and I'm not. It just comes out that way. But every time the NHL seems to have the opportunity to step in to the market where the NBA is. They do the same thing that the NBA does. So, so the strike year. Okay, NBA goes on strike, and the NHL goes on strike too. Really? I mean, here's a perfect opportunity. So my thought was, and I'm going to get the years mixed up, when the strike, the first strike, or the second strike, or the eighth strike, depending upon how you look at it, for the NFL, that strike year when they use the replacement players, had you had that alternative going on at the same time, that would have solidified the USFL's grasp of the market I think at that particular point I'm going to say it's like two years after after the USL folded or something like that that the NFL strike came and I, I'm like I said I just, it, I'm blanking on it right now I think it was in 87 or 88 or something like that I believe and, this year was 87 yeah so if you could have had hung on for one more year or two more years playing wise one more year for the for the organization two more years for the playing wise you'd have said okay We've got players from here, players from there that are playing on established teams now. I think that would have been fantastic. So you don't want to watch the US, the NFL or they don't want to play? Fine, we have an alternative. I think that would have worked out pretty well. And I think the NFL knew that. I mean, you don't a, – a, a player strike just doesn't pop up out of nowhere. The right. NFL knew that a strike was coming. So, uh, you know, it was just the perfect storm. You know, even though, even though the USFL actually won the lawsuit – um, the the reward from it was not enough to make the USFL viable. Now, 
could they have potentially cut back to eight teams and continued on? Maybe, you know, we'll never know. But like my dad always said, if ifs and buts were candy and nuts, we'd all have <laughs> Merry Christmas. And so, uh, yeah, we, we just don't know. I think the die was cast. This is what we decided. And like you said, brash move. We decided this is what we're going to do, hell or high water. If it works, it works. If it doesn't, it doesn't. And it didn't. Oh, well. You know, as long as you made a decision that you were happy with when you made the decision, I guess there's nothing else that can really be said. So, right. So when he says that, he's going to say more. Uh, now, let's look at something real quick before we get out of here. Um, the legacy. Let's look at it from three different perspectives here. We already talked about what, what it brought to the game as far as strategy and things of that nature. Let's start with ownership. What kind of, or just that kind of how we look at the game and how we put things together. What owners, what GMs, what commissioners, what people that said, now we're going to take this and we're going to do that in the NFL? You know, that's a, that's a little bit tough um, to answer just because today's NFL is so much so much different than it was, you know, back in the right. 80s we were playing simply simple football. Um, but there there were some, you know, some good owners. You know, I mentioned John Bassett. Uh, John, John Bassett is another guy who should not only be in um, – who – you know, is in our USFL Hall of Fame, but should be in the CFL Hall of Fame as a pioneer right. and and should be in the Pro Football Hall of Fame for all of the things he did um, in and around football. But, you, you know, you had some you – know, Miles Tannenbaum, you know, that whole team in, in Philadelphia and Baltimore, Miles Tannenbaum, uh, Carl Peterson, Jim Mora, I mean, mm -hmm. those guys were fantastic. Those are – those are some of the examples that I could give you of, of of people who could or would and were successful in other arenas. Okay, looking at coaches and coaching styles that affected the way we see football now. You missed a, a couple of coaches that that maybe not were able to translate themselves from the USFL to the NFL, but their philosophies and what they brought to the table that that affected the way we see the NFL now. I think the I think the two that you have to look at are again Jim Mora because Jim Mora uh, you know came from the Stars and went to the Saints and it had some difficult years but Jim Mora was definitely a success in in all genres of football. Right. Um, I think you look at Mouse Davis and his innovation with Houston carrying that over to Buffalo which led them to four consecutive Super Bowl um, appearances. Um, you know they're. There's quite a few coaches, you know. That Dick Corey didn't have the success, but um, he was a he, he was a good fundamental coach. Um, yeah, there's there's quite a few examples from the USFL that that either did transition to the NFL or would have transitioned to the NFL given the opportunity. I I like to think that Marv Levy, because I remember Marv Levy with the Chiefs, and thinking. This team isn't the Chiefs that just were in the Super Bowl a few years ago, are they? This team is kind of blah. You know, where is Hank Schramm? This team isn't getting the job done. Goes to USFL, and then a year after the USFL folds, he's with the Bills. And again, the Bills were, uh, let's just say, without Joe Ferguson and O.J. Simpson, the Bills weren't the same. And then suddenly, you add the K-Gun in, and of course, you bring in Cornelius Bennett and you know, and all these other fantastic players, don't get me wrong, but something had to put all that together. You know, you, you just didn't find Andre uh, uh, Andre Rebound on his own. You know, these guys had to be put in some place, and the Bills ended up being, and I know we don't give them credit enough because they didn't win a Super Bowl, but they got to four. So I think Marv Levy is an important part of that as well because he received another shot. And I think that what we're talking about in this league is people getting their opportunity. And, and you mentioned a Reggie White, who, made, who was probably an NFL player, but he got the opportunity to show it right then, right away. Uh, again, we mentioned players like, you know, uh, Kelvin Bryant. We mentioned uh, my favorite, you know, the Ice Cube, Gerald McNeil. Uh, a few other players that you can think of that may not have had an opportunity to play in the NFL, or it would have been a bigger struggle, but then 
the USFL gave them a, a platform, and then they ended up becoming very good, if not extremely good, NFL players. You know, I think I think for the most part, when you look at that, you really have to look at the quarterbacks because you know in that in that league um, in in the NFL, putting a rookie quarterback in um, is is a difficult as you know as we talked about earlier with Tua. So I mean, you have to even though. Um, even though that his NFL career post USFL was a little bit of a struggle, you have to look at if you've seen a, I mean, he, right. he lost stars to three championships. We talked about Bobby Abair um, with uh, Michigan and later with the Oakland Invaders. Right. You know, um, you've got Glenn Carano, who was with the Pittsburgh Maulers in 84 and then went on to play in the NFL. I mean, you've got, you've got so many names from the USFL that – that had uh, success in the NFL later. You know, we talked about Sam Mills. Sam Sam Mills would have never made it in the NFL never. as anything more than a special teams player had he not had that experience in the NFL, and he he parlayed it into a huge career. So there are there are way too many names of uh, guys in the USFL that luckily got the opportunity to play spring football that turned it into. Um, a, a good or great NFL career. I mean, obviously, there's some Hall of Famers. We talked about Steve Young and Gary Zimmerman and Jim Kelly. I mean, all all those guys. I mean, they were they were good, but with that USFL experience, it made them great. And we can also look at it another way. And I know we don't do this that often. The NFL isn't always the end all be all of what you do. And I liken what happened to the CFL. That was kind of like, okay, we're going to try this model. And it didn't work, but at least it was something they tried. Now, there were players that went from the NFL, or from, I'm sorry, the USFL to the CFL, and I'm sure from the CFL to the USFL. But there wasn't too long after the USFL, and I'm going to mix the dates up, where the CFL expanded into the United States. It may not have worked, but it was an interesting thing because you had a team in Baltimore, you had a team in, I, I can't remember all the places, but I know there are at least a, a, a dozen NFL. Or, uh, CFL teams in the, in the United States that for some reason are all slipping my mind right now because this isn't something I prepared. But it's the idea of that model was let's try this. And if you've ever watched the CFL game, you know it's not the NFL. Mm -hmm. You know it's football, but you know it's not the NFL. And it's interesting. It's different. It's it's more wide open. It's kind of in my mind what I envisioned the USL, USFL being when I was watching it. Because it's like, we're not just going to go three yards in a cloud of dust. We may run a double reverse. We may do this. We're going to blitz more. We're going to do more things that are more wide open. And I think all of that has helped football in general. The World Football League, for example, I don't think would have existed without the USFL. So there's so many things that I believe came from this, not just the few seasons and then it's gone. So I'm glad that you have this project, and I'm glad it allows us to see the evolution of football more so than just what happened there. So, in, in the conclusion, how important do you think, and even though I just did, so stated what I think, how important do you think, obviously you think it's very important, that USFL is not just in that sphere of those few seasons, but how it's affected the way we take in professional football? You can find the USFL fingerprints on every single football league that exists or existed after 1985. There is, there is something in every league that has come from the USFL. And that's, again, that's one of the many reasons why we're so passionate about it. You can, you can even look at the NFL now um, and, and see the lineage. You've got, uh, you've got Bradley and I, who uh, is with the Dallas Cowboys, and his dad, Brad and I, played for the Houston Gamblers and the San Antonio Gunslingers. Um, you've got uh, you've got the uh, tight end Warner out in um, in San Francisco, right. and his dad played in the USFL as well. The, there's coaches. There's there's all kinds of lineage with the USFL, and that's that's what we want to make sure people understand is that the history of the USFL has 
branched out to every single football league. I mean, you know, Bill Winters is a prime example. Bill Winters played uh, in in Tampa Bay, played in Portland, and Bill Winters uh, was a part of the XFL. He was a part of the AAF. I mean, he he has he's been there and seen it, and he's Bill is very proud of his USFL lineage, but he's gone on to um, help promote the USFL in in all types of right. different leagues. So the USFL fingerprints um, and roots are, are are very vast. And that's why we want to make sure that we capture the legacy of this great league because we want to make sure that it lives on with kids with grandkids with great grandkids we we want to show people why we thought and think that the usfl was the greatest league greatest football league of all time well it's funny you you, you threw something in there that made me think i was on a show a few weeks ago and we were talking about you know the, the basic nfl stuff and trades and who should go where and whatnot and who deserves to go where and whatnot and a particular player came up, and I said, and they said, well, where do you think he should go? And I said, well, because I wasn't sold on him being a player that's going to help another team that much. I said, well, you know, he could go back to the old Cleveland Browns or the, you know, the, or the Cleveland Rams or or the Montreal Wets, or maybe he'd be okay with the, um, you know, the Oakland Invaders, you know, if they brought him back. And a gentleman that was on the panel with us from Texas said, San Antonio Gunslingers. <laughs> and it just like boom it's still there it's still there people still pick up on it right away it's it's something that even though it was short lived people see that and go I remember those days and maybe because it wasn't as easy to find but it was in our face and it was something that was viable so whenever I see the XFL or the American Alliance of whatever the heck it is and I go this is what they're trying to accomplish because the, the blueprint has been late. It's been taken from the AFL, but the AFL went head-to-head. -head. It went through the WFL, uh, WFL, which was just, I think, a money grab for people. Mm -hmm. It's like, we're going to do this, and we're going to do it right. And you mentioned the Dixon plan a few times, and that's, that's a perfect way of looking at it. And, and here's the problem that we have societally or organizationally or whatever, is that we see, hey, this is working. Let's make it bigger. Let's go bolder. And instead of saying... It's going to get there. Let's just grow the product. And I think that that's also a thing that people are understanding as well. And I think that comes from this. This could, and unfortunately it's, it's lamenting, but it's saying this could have been so much, but let's go back and learn a lesson from that and go from there. So I think it's a fantastic thing that you're doing. Uh, uh, please, as we have a special guest on here, uh, uh, give us an idea where I know we've got it on the bottom line here, but where else can we find the USFL project? And and we'll I'd love to have you on again. Um, the easiest way to find the USFL project right now is on Facebook. If you search Facebook groups, look up the USFL project. Um, we have a simple question that you have to answer. Um, we we ask who your favorite USFL team was. If you're young and don't have a memory of the USFL. Just, just tell us, say, I, I, you know, I was young, I wasn't around when the USFL was around, but we do that to keep the Russian bots out of, uh, right. out of our group. And, and so uh, that's the easiest way to find us, the USFL project um, on Facebook groups. We do also have a page where I, we're actually, the page has been around for a long time, but we're working on that. So the group is the best way to be interactive with the USFL at this point in time, but we've got a lot of huge things coming. Okay, well, Kyle, I appreciate you doing this. And, again, there's there's more to come down the road. I hope we can get into some more detail on a few things as I have. Pl and I, I'm a research stat nerd, so I'll I put stuff together and go, well, this guy did this in this league, and this guy did that in this league. And this, oh, I'd love to talk to you about a bunch of stuff like that. So, again, thanks, thanks a lot, and uh, we will get back to you. I'll let you know when we get all this posted, and we'll get it out to all your people, and enjoy your day. All right, sir. Glad to be here, and thanks for having me, and I uh, hope to come back soon.